Good morning. I want to thank each one of you for our presence here today as we come together for this great honor and privilege of worshiping our God. It's always a great honor any time that we have the opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and it's a time that we look forward to. It's good to see some back with us that have not been able to be here due to sickness, and I'm glad that your health has improved to the point that you're able to be back with us, and certainly we pray that you continue to improve. If you would, keep your Bibles open to John chapter 10. This is where we're going to spend our time this morning. All through the Old Testament and the New Testament, we read a lot about sheep and shepherds. And even though we have heard about sheep and shepherds, we do not live in an agrarian society today. And so there's not a lot of information or the intricacies of sheep and shepherds that we really have a deep understanding of based upon our just day-to-day -day lives. But especially how these things would have been in biblical times are things that many people do not have a deep understanding of. And so this morning as we begin our lesson, I'd like to share just some introductory information with you about sheep and shepherds. Now I'm certainly no expert on this subject, but any time that you have something that you can get on the internet and you can Google it or you can open commentaries, things of that nature, they help us a great deal in coming to a better understanding of some of these subjects that may be uh, past what our current knowledge may be. First, there's a couple of things I want to tell you about sheep. Number one, they are defenseless. They do not have jaws that have sharp teeth. They do not have the ability to use their hooves in any type of defense mechanism. They are not aggressive animals whatsoever. They are very docile animals. You know, we may go to people's homes and we may see signs that say, beware of dogs, or we may go into the forest and see signs that say, uh, beware of bears. In Florida, I know you go places and you see signs that say, beware of alligators. I can remember when I was growing up, it's kind of comical thinking about it now, but there was a man that lived out between M. Bowden and Smithville who didn't want anybody trespassing on his property. But he didn't believe that no trespassing signs would be scary enough. And so he went out and all along the highway that fronted his property, he put up big signs that said, beware of rattlesnakes. Now, whether there really were a lot of rattlesnakes on that property or not, I don't know, but it sure kept me from going on that property to find out. But something you never see is a sign that says, beware of sheep. You never see that. It's because they're not fierce animals. They're not animals that are to be feared whatsoever. They are defenseless. In fact, their only defense mechanism is to run away from danger. But with that in mind, shepherd, or, or sheep are not the smartest animals either. When danger comes, they often don't know where to run or when to run. It has been proven that sheep will actually run head on into danger thinking that they're getting away from danger. Shepherds have observed sheep at times when there were great wildfires. The sheep, rather than running away from the fires, would actually run into the fires, would run into this, uh, this flame and bring about their death. Other shepherds have observed sheep that would get close to cliffs, and as one sheep would fall off, all the others would just follow it right along and fall to their deaths. So sheep are not the most intelligent animals. It also has been proven that they do not even have the natural instinct to find their own food and water. 
And so they have to have someone there that can lead them to the right thing to eat, to lead them to a place where they can have that nourishment from water that they need until they become familiar with a location. You know, there are many domesticated flocks of sheep today that they recognize their surroundings. They know that this is where they're supposed to be. They know where to find food. They know where to find water. But just the natural instinct, they're not able to do that. Sheep are not able to find their way. If they get away from their flock, they just remain lost unless the shepherd goes out and finds the sheep. They are defenseless. They need constant supervision. And this is where the shepherd comes in. But what are some things that we need to understand about the shepherd? The shepherd watches over his sheep continually. There is never not a time that this shepherd makes sure that either him or someone that he trusts is watching over that flock. He's leading them to the place where they can receive nourishment. He's leading them to places of safety. He's watching out for their well-being, making sure there's no predators that are coming around and watching, trying to steal away the sheep. But also, shepherds come to have a very strong relationship with their sheep. Back in biblical times, sheep were used mainly for two purposes, and those two purposes are still the main uses today. Number one is for meat, number two is for wool. But in biblical times, they were used more so for wool than they were for meat. And so oftentimes, a shepherd would have the same flock of sheep for many, many years. And he would develop a strong relationship with those sheep, and likewise the sheep would with the shepherd as well. The shepherd would come to give each of his sheep a name or some type of description that he could use to differentiate between them. Oftentimes it would be based upon some type of physical characteristic of the sheep, something that they looked like or some kind of, of attribute of the attitude of that sheep, something of that nature. But also over time, the sheep came to recognize not only their name when it was being called, but they came to recognize the voice of their shepherd. But one of the main goals of the shepherd was to keep the sheep safe. And the way that he would do this was through sheepfolds. And there were two different types of sheepfolds that would be used. One would be a communal sheepfold. And during the cold times of the year, when they were not straying very far from the villages, they would bring the sheep into the villages at night and they would place the sheep into one large holding pen. Generally, it would be made of stone and each shepherd would come in and would place their flocks into this communal sheepfold. But here's where it gets interesting. One person would be assigned as a watchman over the sheepfold throughout the night. And the only people that were allowed to come and gain access to the sheepfold were shepherds that were known to the night watchman. Anyone else that came along and tried to get into the sheepfold at night was automatically considered a thief. But then when morning came, this is where it gets really interesting. Each shepherd would come to the sheepfold, and I want you to picture this image. You have this whole pen that's full of sheep. Everybody's flocks are all in there together. Now, how many of us have ever had the pleasant, uh, the pleasant occasion of trying to sort livestock? Trying to separate cattle, or even worse than that, trying to separate pigs? Well, here's something interesting about sheep. Those shepherds would have such a strong relationship with their sheep that they could come to the door of the sheepfold, they could call the sheep out by name, and only their sheep would come forth from that sheepfold. This is the kind of strong relationship that existed. But then during the warm months, they would go out into the wilderness, and oftentimes they would be gone for weeks at a time. Well, they would go to the place where they were going to allow the sheep to graze and they would construct a temporary sheepfold. And generally this would be made out of logs or stones or just whatever they had available there to provide a secure structure. Well, at night that flock would go into the sheepfold, but this sheepfold would be constructed without a door. 
or without a door that could be closed. And the shepherd at night, he would position himself in front of the opening, the gate or the door to the sheepfold. That way, the only way that the sheep could get out or predators could get in, they had to go through the shepherd. Now, with these things in mind, these are the kinds of things that Jesus is revealing to us in our lesson text for today. And he is presenting this in such a way as he is the shepherd and we are his sheep. I want you to notice with me John chapter 10, but let's back up and let's begin in verse 1. I want us to get a full picture of what Jesus is talking about here. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, folks, out of these 10 verses, this 10th verse is what I want us to recognize mainly. Notice what Jesus says in this verse. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. The way that we would put this today, Jesus is saying, I came that you might live a full life. Now we look at our lives today and there is not a person here that does not want to live a good, full life. We want to live a blessed life. We want to live a happy life. We look at certain things that take place in our lives today and especially we look at certain things in our society today that prove that to us. We look at the flourishing medical community that there is. We look at how the average lifespan of human beings seems to be getting longer and longer every year. There was a time in the lifetime of some of you that is here today that if a man lived to be 50 years old, he was doing good. But now the average lifespan of a human male in the United States of America is now up to 80 years. And there's more and more that we hear about that are living much longer than that. Why? Because of the advances that are there that are aiding us in living a more full, happy life. But not only that, we look at the attention that's given to health. We see things all around us such as health care products, such as vitamins and minerals. We see health food stores. We see things such as health clubs where people go and they exercise and they try to get themselves into better health. How many times have we sat in front of the television and we've seen commercials come up advertising the latest, uh, the latest workout system or the latest exercise machine or the latest... Uh, vegetable juicer that promises to bring us back to a better degree of health. All of these things are promising us a full life, a better, more abundant life. We look at our homes. Is your home more comfortable now than your home was that you grew up in? 
You look at the things that we have in our homes today that even a generation ago you did not see. It was mentioned this morning that we have a nice place here where we can come that's warm in the wintertime, that's cool in the summertime. Very few homes do we see today that do not have air conditioning. Very few homes do we see today that do not have indoor plumbing. Very few homes do we see today that do not have all of the appliances or that are, are seen as necessary in order to live a better life. And then we are constantly wanting to upgrade those things. We're looking for the next big thing, something that's going to make our homes that much better, that much more comfortable, and thereby give us a more abundant life in that way. We look at our cars. Folks, if you look at the truck that I drive, there's not a lot of frills to it. But you get in my wife's car, and you get into some of these more modern vehicles, and you look at all the different buttons, you look at all the different gadgets, you look at all the different comforts, you look at all of the things that are there, and every year, every model that comes out, there's something more to it to bring about more comfort, to bring about more enjoyment, supposedly to make life fuller, to make life better for us. Folks, there is nothing inherently wrong with wanting to live a full, abundant life. My hope is that each and every one of us here want to live a full, abundant life. But with that, I want to take you back to Jesus' statement that he makes here in John chapter 10. Jesus said that he came to make life abundant. He came to give us that full life. And the full life that Jesus promised to us has nothing to do with medicine, has nothing to do with health care products, has nothing to do with exercise, has nothing to do with our homes, has nothing to do with our cars, has nothing to do with the things that our society today tells us brings about a more abundant life. To put this in context, Jesus tells us that this full abundant life has something to do with the kind of shepherd that he is. First off, the shepherd wants his sheep to follow him. The text shows us that there is only one shepherd that could deliver this kind of life that we want, this full and eternal life. And that shepherd's name is Jesus Christ. He is the one that has came to provide that for us. And if we want that abundant life, he's the one that we have to follow. He is the one that we must allow to guide us. He is the one that, as this text says, goes before us. We must follow him and give no attention to the other voices. Give no attention to the others that we hear because the others are thieves and robbers trying to steal our soul away. The good shepherd knows his sheep. Now there are many false shepherds in the world around us who claim to know something about us, who claim to know what we want, what we need, and they put all these nice shiny objects and fancy sounding things in front of us and tell us these are the things that's going to bring you joy, going to bring you satisfaction, that's going to bring you the life that you want to live. But only Jesus knows what we really need. Only Jesus is able to look deep down inside of you and I, is able to see what those deep yearning needs of our soul really are. And the reason that is is because Jesus knows his sheep. He knows us. He knows what we need. And he knows where to find those things that we need. He knows how to provide those things that we so need. And this concept of living life to the fullest has something to do with the fact that Jesus knows who we are. Jesus knows what our needs are. And in fact, the scriptures tell us that Jesus knows what our needs are before we even know what our needs are. The shepherd takes care of every need of his flock. 
Notice with me again this section of scripture that Brother David shared with us in our scripture reading this morning. Verses 11 through 14. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. But he that is a hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, seeth the, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catches them, and scatters the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. Now folks, whatever we consider, what Jesus is telling us in this passage, not only about himself, but about us as well. Jesus says that there are many out there that are trying to be our shepherd. There are many people in the world around us that are trying to tell us what we need. What we need to do, where we need to go, what we need to take, how we need to live. But they're just pretenders. They make you believe these things. They make you believe that they can supply all of your needs. But Jesus says they're just hired hands. They're just out there to make a buck, to make a paycheck. They could care less about you. He says, but when times get tough, when danger comes, when pressure comes, they're going to tuck tail and run because they have no, uh, no interest whatsoever in taking care of you, in taking care of your soul. But Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And when danger comes, he says, even if it costs me my life, I'm not going away. And as this good shepherd, regardless of what that danger may be, Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you because I love you and care about you. So this full abundant life has something to do with the shepherd who knows us but also has something to do with the shepherd that can take care of us and who's willing to lay down his life for us. But this full life also has something to do with us as well. It's not just all about Jesus. This full life also has something to do with the kind of sheep that we are. And here's what I mean by that. This may be the hardest part of this whole lesson for us to appreciate. Because to put ourselves in the position that we truly need to be, our life must be fully centered on humility. You remember what I said earlier about sheep being defenseless? We don't like to think of ourselves as being defenseless. We like to think of ourselves as being strong. We like to think of ourselves as being able, as being capable of protecting ourselves and providing for our needs. But folks, there is not a person in this building today that is strong enough to stand on our own against Satan. Think about that for just a minute. There is not a single one of us that will be successful in going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan by ourselves. We cannot do that and survive. It's just not going to happen. In fact, just like sheep, the only defense that we have against Satan on our own is to run away, to flee. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18, he says to flee sexual immorality. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22, he tells us to flee youthful lust. Run away from it. Get away from those things as fast as you can. But never do we see the Bible telling us to stand your ground and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan by yourself. We don't see that, do we, Don? No, we don't see that at all. You remember Joseph when he was in Egypt? He was taken into the home of Potiphar and he was really a blessing to that household. He did a lot of good things, but then something inappropriate began to happen. Potiphar's wife began to make advances toward him. And Joseph knew that this was not something that he needed to succumb to, so what did he do? He ran away. He ran away from it, got away from that as fast as he could, so that he would not be tempted. Got himself away from that. 
when we find ourselves in those same kinds of situations. When we find ourselves surrounded by sin, surrounded by temptation, the best thing that we can do is to get away, run away from it, flee, get as far away from that danger as we can. But also, remember that I mentioned earlier that sheep aren't very smart. Now, what I'm about to say is not intended to be an insult toward any person that is here today. I know that I'm talking to a group of people that are pretty intelligent. You're smart people. I like to think of myself as being pretty smart, pretty intelligent. But even the brightest person in this room is not smart enough to direct our own steps in this life. You know, Jeremiah got it right in Jeremiah 10 and verse 23 when he said, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walketh to direct his own steps. Jeremiah got it right. He understood that it does not matter how smart you are. You're not smart enough to direct your own steps. If we want to live a complete, full, abundant, and eternal life, then we have to have a shepherd. We are sheep, and we have to have a shepherd. But also, it has something to do with our listening to the shepherd's voice. You know, just by saying that Jesus is our shepherd doesn't make him so. Every day we go out into this world, and we hear countless voices calling out to us. We hear countless voices calling us to do this, say this, take this action, do these things. But it's our responsibility to only listen to one. It is our responsibility to keep our ears open only to the voice of our shepherd. You know, when the shepherds would come to the sheepfold in the morning and they would begin to call out the names of their sheep, only their sheep were listening. Only their sheep would hear the voice of their shepherd and come forth from the sheepfold. That was the only thing that would get them to take action was hearing the voice of their shepherd. Now there are many people today and there are many churches today that those who stand in the pulpit all they want to talk about are the latest ideas, the latest philosophies, what the uh, latest best-selling authors have to say on certain matters. Well, folks, I'm going to say I'm proud that the Pyburn Street Church of Christ doesn't really care that much about those things. We want to know what the Bible has to say. We want to know what the Good Shepherd has to say, and that's why we groom ourselves to listen to the voice of Christ. And when we hear an unfamiliar voice, we don't pay heed to those things. We pay heed only to the voice of our shepherd. But I want to give you one last perspective this morning. We're getting short of time. But I want to just really quickly give you one last perspective. And folks, this isn't coming from me, but it's coming from someone who really had experience in these matters. As a young man, he was a shepherd. He knew about sheep. He knew about the qualities that were necessary to be a shepherd. As he grew to adulthood, he, began, he became the guide of many men. But he always saw himself as a sheep in need of a guide, a sheep in need of a shepherd. And we all know the words of his most famous writing. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We recognize that scripture, don't we? It's the 23rd Psalm. Just very quickly, I want to paraphrase for you what David is saying here. First off, David is saying he's thankful that God is the good shepherd. 
Because David is saying that with God as his good shepherd, he doesn't have to worry about anything in this life. He knows that everything will be fulfilled. He knows that he can live his life in such a way that he does not have to be overcome with the cares and the worries of this life. Because the Lord is his shepherd and he shall not want. David recognizes that the good shepherd takes care of all of his physical needs. In sheep terms, the shepherd leads him to the right kind of pastures, to the right kind of waters. He leadeth me beside the still waters, makes me to lie down in green pastures. The good shepherd is providing him with what he needs. The good shepherd also was providing for his spiritual needs. Deep down, he understood that the good shepherd was what was giving him that rejuvenation that he needed that was restoring his soul and was directing him in the paths of righteousness, leading him in the way that he needed to go. The good shepherd also, David recognized, was continually leading him and protecting him. Even if he was in the valley of the shadow of death, he knew he didn't have to fear because God was always with him, always protecting him, driving away danger with his staff and his rod. When he was surrounded by his enemies, he knew that God would be there and that with God on his side, he would make a mockery of his enemies and that he would be blessed even when it seemed that his odds were against him. But then David says this last thing. His life was made more abundant because of the good shepherd. He said, my cup overflows. Folks, that's another way of saying what Jesus said in John chapter 10 about abundant living. David says, my life is so full and abundant that it is like my cup is running over. And I dare to say that there is not a single one of us in this building today that is not drinking from the saucer because our cup has overflowed. We have been blessed beyond measure because we have the good shepherd. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is this. Do we want to live that blessed life? Do we want to live a full, abundant life? If so, are we willing to submit and follow the guidance of our shepherd? Jesus is the good shepherd. The only way to get into the sheepfold, folks, the church is the sheepfold. The only way to get there is through Jesus Christ. And the only way to stay there is through Jesus Christ. And so this morning, there's essentially two invitations that are being extended. The first invitation is this. If you need to confess Christ, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you recognize that you need to turn away from your sins, you have an invitation this morning to confess Christ and to be baptized into Christ, to be added to the body of Christ. But the second invitation is this. Maybe you're a sheep that's gone astray. Maybe you've stopped listening to the voice of the shepherd. You've strayed away and you've found yourself lost. The shepherd's voice is calling out to you, asking you to come back today, to be restored, come back into the sheepfold, come back to that place of safety. This morning, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we encourage you to come while we stand and sing.